Let's get buck wild right now. And I do mean buck wild. Uh, the Paradigm Shift episode 72. Consistency, commitment. Uh, let's get nuts. Uh, waiting for Big Dave. There he is. Uh, always so punctual and sharp and super handsome. Uh, let's bring you on right now and let's get warmed up. We have a very special guest today, which I'm extremely excited about. Uh, let's get nuts. Mom in the house. How you doing, Mom? Uh, Big Dave, the sex 60 second man coming on right now. Yeah. <laughs> What's up? How you doing, Big Dave? And I do mean big. I'm big. <laughs> Let me see those things. Holy shit. Fucking trends. Good for you. Good, man. Push-ups. Good to see you. Great to see you. How you doing? I'm good, man. It was nice to see you in New York City in the rain. Yes. E even if only a short time, uh, it's always good to see you. I always feel energized when I'm around you. Absolutely, no, no man. Yeah. Um, I love you. So so let's get going. Let's do it. Uh, first what do you got for me? I have a lot for you, pal. I'm excited about our guest. Um, and, and we'll get right to it. One of the things you were talking about this week, which really excited me, because it's something I'm working on, and I'm a work in progress, and I think everybody can do a better job of this to some extent, uh, and I don't think you phrased it like this, but it, but it was similar to what you're talking about, is really cultivating and strengthening and building our receiving muscle. Yeah, I think that a lot of people don't live in a value-add world. They live in a zero-sum game. And it's part of our ego that there's not enough. So we trade, we negotiate, we live in a manner of quid pro quo where you know we give something to receive. And as most things in this realm, uh, it's counterintuitive receiving because the act of receiving is to add value to the person you're receiving from, not to add value to you. See, true acknowledgement occurs when you give something away, when it's lost, stolen, manipulated from you. The only acknowledgement that can occur, the only way to acquire knowledge, act knowledge, what we have, is to not have it anymore. And majority of the people on earth live in a zero sum game. They give to receive. They believe that they are taking away, that there's winners and losers, uh, but there isn't a zero sum game. It's a value add game. Every time we receive, we're adding value. Every time we acknowledge, we are adding value. And when you put your faith in more than enough, guess what you will receive? more than enough of everything for everyone. And that's my objective in my life is to empower people with this understanding that giving and receiving is one. The same you know, context, the biggest waste of time exists between giving and receiving, between problems and solutions. Most people create an interval of time between the two because each are a cause and effect. A problem is a cause, the effect is the solution, giving is a cause, receiving is the solution, they are one. Beautifully said. And I see Eric on here. Eric, we're going to bring you on in just a couple of minutes. Uh, Dave, I love the way you articulated that as usual. I want to ask you, like, when did you realize like, for certain that we're actually here meant to be abundant and that we had to block out the interference like you always talk about, as opposed to I think most people think that we're meant to be scarce and they're trying to figure out how to be abundant? You know, when I started studying time 16 years ago, uh, in realizing how much time I was spending in interference. Once I created faith that I was connected to and through something bigger than me, whether or not you believe in a philosophy, a spirituality, or a religion, it doesn't matter. Once I believed there was something bigger than me that loved me more than my mom loves me, once I believed that I am happy, healthy, wealthy, and worthy, and started to focus in on what am I doing to interfere with infinity? What am I doing to interfere with more than enough? Once that paradigm had shift, then it was just a matter of time and studying time, the relativity of the past, which is, you know, always relying upon defined moments or inflection points of our past, the relativity of the future that is limitless combined or reconciled with the reality of today, which is constructive and limited by 
24 hours. And so once I studied the utilization of time within the context of abundance, I was able to then determine in the context that we're living 24 hours, how much time am I spending in interference? How much time am I spending in abundance? And over the 16 years, I've been able to decrease, dissolve and dissipate the amount of time that I get in my own way, the amount of time I create interference through ego edging goodness out of uh, your life. In fact, one of the things is I coach you that I see that we're trying to raise the awareness of is your ego in that idea of reconciliation. And every one of my mentees that I have from chairmen of Fortune 500 companies uh, to billionaires that I coach, this is the main aspect. And sometimes, you know, I get to be a hard ass about it, like a football coach, because to me, when you have great potential like Craig Siegel and you get in your own way, I just want to slap you across the face like in Moonstruck, uh, you know, and like share to uh, Nicolas Cage and just go snap out of it because I don't want you to make or have to pay the dummy tax that I paid over the 16 years. And I'm trying to raise the awareness of everyone that you are all living in abundance. Don't misuse time. You don't have to have a huge interval of time between cause and effect. All problems and solutions, all giving and receiving are one. I received all of that, uh, but I can't help but think, how many beautiful bison burgers did you consume tonight? You know, I, I'm on number three. I think I'm going to have three more today. I'm going to a wedding in a few hours, a daytime wedding. So I think I'll have some more beautiful bison burgers so that I can be half as good looking as you. Yeah, you're going to be going to another wedding in about a year from now, too. Oh, I will be there with gifts in hand. I will be giving and receiving at that wedding. Yeah, are you, are you going to have a microphone that night? If you If you want me to have the mic, I will give a speech like you've never heard before. Understood. I will cry, by the way. Really? Oh, yeah, for sure. Why? Because I, I'm, uh, uh, crying is like perspiration. When you get overwhelmed, when you get overheated, you perspire to cool yourself down. When I get connected to the great source with true love and emotion, which I have for you and, uh, of course, your fiance, I'm going to be overwhelmed and uh, I'm going to break down uh, with that emotion uh, in tears, the perspiration of happiness. I love you and thank you for saying that. Also, you said recently, Correct me if I'm wrong, but being overwhelmed is a sign of abundance. For sure. You just got to use prioritization. Overwhelmed is a sign of abundance. It's also, if you feel overwhelmed, it means that you need to work on your prioritization. Because if you prioritize, it's the antidote to procrastination and feeling overwhelmed. I love it. And I love you so much that it's concerning. I'm going to bring on Eric Anders right now. And let's get this party going. Big fan, Eric. He's a stud. Me too. Yeah, he is. I'm definitely not going to be the most handsome guy now. <laughs> That's for sure. What's up, fellas? What's up, E? Man, good, man. Been listening while I'm trying to figure this thing out. I'm not very tech savvy, and it's a very super interesting topic you guys want to know. Much better than some people we've had in the past. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> You're here. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, brother, today on a beautiful Saturday morning. We appreciate it. Uh, the audience is in for a treat. Uh, and let's get started. Uh, for the audience that might not be familiar with Eric, my suggestion, go do it. Dive, all the cool stuff he's got going on. What I really love about you, brother, and I'm excited to connect after this too, is just your mentality. Uh, and, and I was curious because you had an awesome football career in MMA. What were some traits in both those sports that are applicable to make you successful everywhere? Uh, I think attention to detail is probably the most important uh, thing for anything. You know, um, you study an opponent, like you see little tendencies like football or uh, MMA, but like maybe you're doing a business deal. You have to read the fine print. Like you have to do the little things. You got to wake up early, go to sleep late. You know, you have to maximize your time and day. And how do you do that? You know, you don't spend all day, you know, flipping through Instagram or, you know, social media. You know, you go out there and, you know, network or do whatever you have to do. And it's, you know, uh, they say the devil's in the details. And I think that's absolutely true, man. You, you don't cross an I or dot a T, you know, uh, you go from like a 4% uh, interest on a mortgage to a 7% because, you know, they sent you the wrong numbers and you just took it for granted and just, you know, signed it when they sent it to you. You know, that almost happened to, excuse me, that almost happened to us uh, on, this, on this next house that we're closing on, like, my old lady was reading it. She said, man, these numbers aren't right. You know, so she sent it back, got it right. And, you know, everything's, you know, hunky-dory now. So 
I think a lot of people, you know, just try to like skip steps and do things the easy way. And uh, it's not like that. Successful people don't do that. Yeah, and just to add on that, and Dave, I want you to chime in. What, the same thing, right? You always say, like, people are so scared of the hard work. Yeah, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's going to take the sweat of your brow to be successful in anything. And if you're comfortable, you know, going in and punching somebody else's clock and, you know, doing the nine to five thing and just being responsible for, you know, those few hours, you know, that's cool. You know, there are people like that. And there's a reason why there's a 1%, you know, because the 99% or 98% or whatever, they're not willing to do all the things it takes to, to be in that 1%. So, you know, that's why we like athletes, there's 1%. You know, uh, wealthy people, one percent. You know, uh, try to be, and then I, you don't have to like. You know, I'm not saying you have to like chase a dollar. Like that might not be fulfilling to you, but whatever it is, you know, if you're in that top five, three, one percent, man, you're doing all right for yourself. The same frequency. Yeah, of course, man. The one percent of the one percent, the people that go the extra mile every once in a while and then use every once in a while to justify why they're not where they want to be. I want to tell E that there's one reason I don't fight uh, and it's right here. Uh, this is way too big of a target, so I would not yeah. be successful. You, you can see mine now. It's perfect. <laughs> it's probably going to be that uh, way for the rest of my life. So. But, you know, it's interesting because I work with so many professional athletes and transition them into by utilizing what they their consistent, persistent pursuit into the business world. And it's interesting because one of the areas uh, where they have difficulty and it's where I had difficulty when I transitioned as an entrepreneur and it's being more interested than interesting. You know, as yeah. professional athletes, uh, we become very interesting to people and we get into the habit of being very interesting. And there's a saying I have that uh, another uh, uh, friend of mine who's a professional athlete told me, he said, Dave, you're the expert of trusting people, but vetting them as well. So I have a trust and vet uh, process. And I believe that vetting people really hard, asking difficult questions, reading the fine print, doing due diligence and research on people is actually trusting them with trust. Because I'll give you an example. If my mom tells me something, I'm not afraid to ask her questions about it because I know she loves me and she has my best interest in mind. In other words, I trust her so much. I feel comfortable asking those questions. For some reason, we go ahead and we pretend like we trust you and then we're too afraid to ask a hard question like hold on a second isn't the interest rate supposed to be seven percent or four percent instead of seven percent i think you made a miscommunication or an error here and i have seen multi-million dollar transactions tumble into all types of different interference because people don't trust and vet so i love the fact that you grabbed hold of that habit plus the habit of getting into the habit of consistent, persistent pursuit, live in the empty mile, go the extra mile every day. Don't justify where you're not because you went the extra mile every once in a while saying, oh, two weeks ago I did that. No, it's every day, seven days a week. Don't have to do as much every day, but you gotta do it every single day. Go ahead, Craig. I was gonna say, uh, one, first of all, I love what you said, David, and use the word vet, and, and E, doing some homework on you, brother. And because obviously I want to be prepared for this conversation. One thing that you two do better than anyone I've ever really seen is is tie confidence to preparation, right? E? Yeah, you know, there's a saying that says there is confidence in preparation. And, you know, that's the approach I take into fighting. You know, I've, I've gotten into fights where I really didn't do my homework on the guy. And I was like, shit, I don't know about this one. But on the ones that, you know, you do the homework, of course, like the margin of error is real small and there's no such thing as a guaranteed victory. But, you know, your confidence going into a fight, knowing that you've done everything, you've done all the strength training, you dieted correctly, you, you did the, the running, the lifting, the training, the diet, the everything. Like going into the fight, is like, all right, I'm 100% or close to 100% as you can be. And uh, man, you can go out there, cut loose and have fun. Rather than, you know, you get it. It's a terrible feeling to get in there and be like, damn, I didn't do this. I should have done that more. Or be in the middle of the fight, be like, I knew he was going to do this, but I didn't train this, and you know. So, yeah, you have to have attention to detail, and there is confidence in the preparation of whatever it is that you're going into, whether it be a business deal, a fight, football game, uh, you know, if you run a landscaping business, you know. 
you know, just doing everything right. Yeah, and also real quickly, like, what's so, I've, I've been there before myself, and I get mad at myself. I'm still human. Of course, I'm, I'm still learning. But the cool thing about for the audience listening today is preparation is effort. And that's something that we can all control, right, Dave? Yeah, absolutely. Preparation and practice. I always say I get on really big stages now and, you know, my kids watch some of my speeches on YouTube, the, er the early uh, TED Talks. They're like, Dad, you kind of seem nervous. And I said, yeah, because I wasn't as well practiced as I am today. And if I asked you to come on a big stage with me, you know, my 18 year old daughter, and I just asked you, why don't you just come out on stage with me and clap once and leave? You would not be nervous. You'd be confident that you can clap because you've clapped so many times. It's, it's second nature. It's inherent in your conscious continuum. And so the people who prepare more, practice more actually have cleared the interference between them and the great source that we're connected to there is something bigger than us it's all powerful all knowing and omniscient and the more that we practice and the more we prepared we are actually clearing the interference between us and that power so that power shows up as intellect it shows up as intuition and it also shows up as confidence. And all three of those are what Eric uses in the, the, the octagon. He uses those, his intellect, his intuition, and his inspiration, and preparation and practice are the mechanism that he has utilized every day, like we said, in order to effectuate a higher level that creates better significant statistical success in what he does. And I see that with executives, with salespeople, with great speakers and coaches like Craig, and of course, professional athletes like our dear friend E next to me. Yeah, that, that was awesome, uh, straight up. And, and Eric, I, I know that you take such pride in, in just working your, for, for lack of better words, and I've heard people say to you in the past, like, why does E always go so hard? Like, he doesn't practice stuff like that. What do you say to those type of cats, Eric? I mean, well, first of all, like, I'm not, like, everybody thinks I'm just, like, this phenomenal, like, Calvin Johnson-esque athlete, and I'm not. I'm an athlete by trade. Nothing ever came easy to me. So, from an early age, I learned, hey, dude, if you want to be successful, if you want to, like, achieve and make it to the next level, hard work is your way. You know, I'm only 6'1". When I was in high school, I was, like, 100. I think the biggest I got was, like, 200 pounds playing defensive end. Not necessarily, not exactly... You know, D1 defensive end, outside linebacker material. You know, those guys are like 6'5", 260, 6'4", you know. So I knew if I wanted to make it hard work and outworking everybody, I call it being an effort guy. You know, people, when I was growing up, like the kids, like the guys on my team, they always be like, oh, he's a try hard. And I, I never, ever took that as an insult. I'm like, yeah, that's what I'm supposed to be doing. That's how I'm going to get better. That's why I'm going to play at the next level and you're going to go, you know, whatever it is that you're going to do. Uh, Cause these are my goals. And, you know, I think a lot of people get deterred because of what other people say and think about what it is that they're trying to do. Like no matter how outlandish it sounds like, you know, every single kid who plays high school football wants to play in college, but how many of those kids are like physical anomalies that hit, just hit that genetic lottery. Like, whether they work out or not, they're still going to be 6'4", 280. Like, you can't teach size. So, of course, those kids are going to make it with less effort because, like, they're more talented, they're bigger, stronger, faster, you know. There are people like that. But what people don't realize is that there's way less people like that than there are people who get there through hard work and dedication. You know, I, I was getting up at, you know, before school, going and working out. Then we had practice during school and then practice after school. So I was working out three times a day. I made 100. I went in and made my own highlight tape, uh, which took forever. Then I made 125 copies and sent it to every single FBS school. Like, I wanted to do this. Like, this was my dream to, you know, play college football, then make it to the NFL, you know. So I was going to make sure that I did everything that I possibly could so that, you know, when I get older, you know, I got kids now. I never, ever, I would never, ever have to say I should have done this. I wish I would have done that. I regret not doing. The only thing I regret doing is like, you know, and maybe, maybe I partied a little bit too much, you know, when I was in college, but, you know, uh, hindsight is my thing, but to get there, I did everything. And when I went to practice, I did everything, max effort, 
uh, because I knew, like, like I said, I was a smaller guy, and the only way that I was going to be able to be successful was if the ball ran away from my side of the uh, field to go chase that guy down and get a tackle. That's a stat on the stat sheet. So when they read the stats, oh, Eric had 10 tackles in this game. Well, you know, I had to run eight of them down, you know, on the other side of the field. You know, I never walked, never jogged. And this is the same conversation that I have with my kids now. Dave, here's a similar superpower to you in, in being consistent. But also, Dave, I was wondering, do you know a thing or two about partying a little bit too much back in the day? <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I was much smaller as well. And my dream was to be in the NFL. And the closest I've come to my potential is being an average college football player. But I weighed 147 and, you know, at 5'7". But I was always called the try hard. You know, quit showing off. Quit. I wasn't. I was just doing my best learning lessons and having fun. And to that end, when I achieved great success outside of the football field uh, by applying what I learned on the football field, doing my best learning lessons and having fun every day because I didn't have what the other people, a genetic and energetic inheritance, you know, I excelled so quickly and made millions of dollars and I got caught into, we were talking earlier about this world of abundance. I got caught in the world of zero sum. Right. So I, I literally got caught surrounding myself with the wrong people, the wrong ideas. And, you know, because I had a genetic and energetic inheritance to be really good off the football field in business and in sales, then I was no better, you know, than those great guys you played football with that didn't try hard and surrounded themselves with the wrong people and the wrong ideas and ended up in a bad place by aggregating bad behavior to utilize as a detriment to what they've been gifted by God, right? And I see so many athletes do this, uh, that success comes so easy to them because they're in alignment with their genetic and energetic inheritance that they take it for granted. It's one thing for people to take for granted what other people are wishing for, but I see, you know, in my own circumstance, when I was young, I actually took for granted what I was wishing for. All that success, all that money, everything that I had. And I had to go and transition and, and shift my paradigm and create faith in my life. You know, one of the most powerful things, Eric and Craig, is when, you know, my mom confronted me about, you know, making bad decisions and t told me about the aggregate effect of bad behavior. And, you know, she warned me, you know, hey, honey, you got to take better care of yourself. You got to surround yourself with the right people. You, you show me your friends. I'll show you your future. And, you know, I, I, I did listen to her. And, you know, sure enough, that advice uh, came true uh, because I ignored the fact of what got me there. And then finally, my wife, as you know, Craig, told me, you know, she was leaving me, take stock in who I was or what I wanted to become or I was going to end up dead. And, you know, that saved my life because I was going to lose, you know, looking like this, I was not going to lose my wife. <laughs> Am I, I was going to get any better than that. I, I got, I won the lottery when it comes to wives. I was going to blow that. And, you know, I, I use that as encouragement to everyone that we need to pursue our own potential. Don't take for granted what you're wishing for, but don't take advantage, uh, for granted what other people wish for as well. That was awesome. So we dropped the mic. I, I'm so thankful and grateful and appreciative to by you guys say this was an awesome conversation. I'm better for it. Eric, what's the best way for the audience and the community to support you, brother, and follow you along your journey? Yeah, you know, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, they're all Eric Anders, E-R-Y-K-A-N-D-E-R-S. And, uh, man, before we get off, man, I really wanted to touch on something that you said about, you know, athletes uh, being relevant and, and, you know, them being popular and they're not popular. You know, I think, like, for me, like, I, I did a lot of stuff in between, uh, you know, MMA, football and MMA. Like, a lot of people think I just quit football to do MMA, but no one would ever do that. Like, the pay scale is, like, not even comparable. And, um, but I think, like, like when you, like, when you, like, essentially, I feel like I failed at something, and I wasn't ever going to get that back. No, no redos, no do-overs. Every year, there's younger, stronger, bigger, faster guys coming down the pipeline. So, like, if you've been out for a year or two, they're not looking for you anymore. But I think once I found my passion, it made it easier to do everything with purpose. You know, and I was just, you know, I, I was a janitor at one point. I used to hate getting up, going to work, you know, doing that, you know, cleaning toilets, mopping floors. I hated it. My life was miserable then. 
you know, I started training, found a passion and, and developed that passion. And then my life, you know, even though I still had to work, because uh, you don't get paid as an amateur very much. So I still had to work and do all these things, raise a kid, you know, do all these things uh, by myself. Like my life got so much better because one, like it's good stress relief. And I found my passion. I knew like I, I had like a, a road to go down. The, like I knew I didn't want to be a janitor for the rest of my life, but I knew that if I dedicated myself and fought and, and did the best fighter that I could, like my life would substantially get easier, you know, financially. And because like I wake up in the morning, it's like, oh yeah, I want to go train. I want to go run. I want to go do these things to be successful. So I think, you know, uh, I think you said like redesign your, your purpose or whatever, but if you find a passion in something, uh, it makes everything so much easier because you want to do it. It doesn't feel like work, you know what I mean? What an awesome final nugget, right, Dave? Amazing, man. Your thoughts about your purpose are your purpose. We get to do everything. We don't got to do it. And when we make that conscious choice, we make everything relative to that purpose. We give meaning to everything that we see. And Eric's a perfect example of that and being able to apply his skills, his knowledge, but especially his desire to that purpose, which will allow him to have the passion that he has, the purpose that he has. It also lead to profitability because money follows passion and purpose. Money follow. You can't chase it with passion and purpose. Money will follow the passion and the purpose like Eric, like Craig, and like myself. I just want to tell everyone, be more interested than interesting. Be kind to your future self. Do good deeds. Eric, if you need anything, man, you just reach out to me. I mentor a lot of guys like you, and I can give uh, touches of favor, options, and opportunities to keep you in an accelerated pace towards what you want or think that you want. And I'm so proud of you, man. Keep up the great work. Thank you so much. Awesome. awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Craigie. Have a great time. Guys. Stay blessed, everyone. Go Padres. Woo! <laughs> see you later. Yeah, good one. <laughs> 72 in the books. We'll see you guys next week. If you don't already, go follow Eric. Check out the amazing things he's got going on. And obviously, Big Dave uh, as gets unbelievable content. Love you guys. Let's have an unbelievable rest of the weekend. You dig?